Good and gracious Father, thank you for this day. Thank you as always for the time and the place to study your word. Open our hearts and minds to continue to understand how Jesus is our great king and our great high priest and that all of our approaches to you are through him and because of him. In his name we pray. Amen. Okay, so we're still in, in Hebrews chapter 4, but we're going to move it along a little bit. I think we'll start in verse... Go to verse 9. So the beginning of the chapter, you know, we've read uh, Psalm 95, which is where these quotations are coming from, from the Old Testament. And it's talking about the ability to enter into the rest of God, the place of rest. And now because verse 6 says, uh, now we can... Enter the place of rest. It's open to all believers. Um, the sab Sabbath celebration in the place of rest is given to God's people. So verse 9 says, For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Since therefore we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Okay. So because Jesus first entered God's place of rest by his entry into the heavenly sanctuary as we've read basically from the beginning of this sermon by the preacher since Hebrews 1 1 talking about Jesus entering into his throne his kingship entering into his place of rest after his ascension uh, now his followers followers of Christ can enter into that rest too and the preacher uses a new word he makes up a completely new word uh that's only used here. And that is, uh, I can't even read my own writing. Yeah. Sabatiliari. Sabatiliari. Uh, so, sabati, sabatismos. So, sabatismos means Sabbath celebration. And that word is to dis distinguish between the eternal rest that you get from the Old Testament Sabbath celebrations. You can look at Leviticus 23, 6-7, uh, 23, 39, uh, for where they talk about the special Sabbath uh, on festival pilgrim days uh, at the temple. And then Isaiah also prophesied about the new Zion, which would replace the temple in the new heavens and the new earth, which is where John got it when he put it in Revelation. So Isaiah 66, 1, Isaiah 66 being the great prophecy of, of Christ coming. Uh, Isaiah 65, 17, actually let's look at some of those. So Isaiah, Isaiah 66, 1 says, yes, I think we were going to go there two weeks ago, and that's where we were going to start, so. All right, so Isaiah 66, 1 says, Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me, and what is the place of my rest? So, of course, God can't be locked up within walls. We don't make a, we don't make a, we don't build a church with a sanctuary, and we think our God is locked up in it as Pagans uh, sometimes do, um, like the house gods they had in Roman paganism. You had 
all these different gods you worshipped, and there's temples all over the place to all these different gods. And then in your house, you had your personal house gods, so you had little idols, and you would splash water and leave them little grain offerings and stuff, and, and kind of bow to the house gods when you walk in. All right, so our God doesn't do that. He's not bound by time and space. Isaiah 65, 17 says, For behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth, and the former things will not be remembered or come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be a gladness. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. No more shall be heard it, in it, the sound of weeping and the cry of distress. And of course, we get that passage from Revelation 21 uh, that we hear at funerals most often. You know, in the, uh, behold, I am creating all things new. I'm creating a new heaven and a new earth. Uh, I will be their God. You shall be my people, and I will wipe every tear from their eye, basically. <coughs> so the new Jerusalem is heaven. You know, which will then, that new Jerusalem will come to earth in the new earth. And uh, that is where we will dwell with God and there is no light because God is our light and there will be no temple because you don't need a temple. Christ is our temple and we are his temple. Uh, so you don't need any of that stuff. And then 66, 10 to 14 says, Rejoice with Jerusalem and be glad for her, all you who love her. Rejoice with her in joy, all you who mourn over her. That you may nurse and be satisfied from her consoling breast, that you may drink deeply with delight from her glorious abundance, for thus says the Lord, Behold, I will extend peace to her like a river. These are all famous, famous lines out of Isaiah. And the glory of the nations like an overflowing stream, and you shall nurse, you shall be carried upon her hip and bowed on her knees. As one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you. You shall be comforted in Jerusalem. You shall see, and your heart shall rejoice, your bones shall flourish like the grass. And the hand of the Lord shall be known to his servants, and he shall show his indignation against his enemy. Uh, extend peace like a river. That's a funeral hymn, isn't it? Yeah. Wouldn't peace like a river, isn't it? Yeah. And then Isaiah sixty-six eighteen. For I know their works and their thoughts, and the time is coming to gather all the nations and tongues. And they shall come, and they shall see my glory, and I will set a sign among them. And from them I will send survivors to the nations. And it goes you know, on like that. They should bring all your brothers from all nations as an offering to the Lord on horses and in chariots and in litters and mules and dromedaries to my holy mountain, Jerusalem. For as the new heavens and the new earth that I will make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your offspring and your name remain. So now we will meet with God forever then in that holy Jerusalem for adoration of God as well as communal celebration. And then Psalm 92 was chosen as the psalm of the Sabbath during the time of the second temple. So we heard Psalm 95 before. Psalm 92 was also used in that way as a Sabbath prayer. Uh, and the way that uh, God's people enter this rest is through uh, hearing his word. So the Sabbath celebration, the special word that the preacher invented, uh, denotes that eternal Sabbath. So he's making a distinction between Sabbath celebrations in the Old Testament, even Sabbath celebrations in the Second Temple period in the New Testament era. He is making a distinction to this eschatolo eschatological uh, celebration that's going to take place uh, without end in the new Jerusalem. Uh, so uh, Psalm 92, uh, which we hear, was it just a couple weeks ago? It was part of the introit. Uh, it's good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night. That's also in our liturgy of uh, Vespers. Yeah, it's Vespers, yeah. To the music of the lute, the harp, the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your works. At the works of your hands I sing for joy. How great are your works, O Lord! Your thoughts are very deep. 
A stupid man cannot know, the fool can't understand, that though the wicked sprout like grass and all evildoers flourish, they're doomed to destruction forever. But you, O Lord, are on high forever, for behold your enemies, O Lord, for behold your enemies shall perish. All evildoers will be scattered. And it continues, uh, you'll be exalted like the horn of the wild ox. You've poured over me fresh oil. Remember, every time you hear about pouring, pouring oil, that anointing, uh, like Christ means anointed one, uh, anoint, you anoint kings with oil, and then we are anointed with water and spirit in baptism. Uh, and that all that imagery carries on into what the preacher is preaching about. Uh, declare the, ultimately, to declare the last verse of Psalm 92, to declare that the Lord is upright, he is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. Uh, so that calls that image to mind. Right, so we listen to his voice, and when we listen to his voice in the divine service, that takes our minds to that scatological, that end times place of rest. I mean, we're here to rest on our Sabbath rest on our seventh day. Uh, just as God rested from his labors, he commanded us to do the same thing. And oh, by the way, since your body needs rest, what else do you have to do than come listen to my word and have your spirit regenerated too? So we come, we worship, we pray, and then our minds take us to that, that eschatological end times rest. Okay, now you keep talking about this new word that was invented. Is it, I don't see it written in. It, ju it just translates as Sabbath rest. <coughs> it's one of the little nuances of the original languages that you don't get in a translation. And so you have this word, it's only used here, mm -hmm. and he, he kind of coined it um, to go, okay, everybody's going to hear that. It's like a compound word and say, oh, Sabbath rest, okay, but this is, oh, he, nobody ever kind of used it that way before. And it's to like make a point. Yeah, you have Sabbath rest, we come to the temple, but now this is the real Sabbath rest, the Sabbath of all Sabbaths. Uh, but then again, when you translate it to English, you just get Sabbath rest. Now, there are translations that unpack all that stuff to you. There's a translation called the Amplified Bible, or called AMP. You'll see it abbreviated, just AMP. And that puts in brackets little expanded definitions of terms sometimes that, that nuance you get from the original language. And it's, a, it's a nifty Bible. You can't read it. You just can't. It's more for like studying because if you're just reading along and you just have your inner voice go read the parentheses when it reads a word, you can do that, but it's clunky. Uh, but it, it helps you to get some of that nuance that we lose in a translation in any language. Uh, so the Amplified Bible is kind of cool. And there is also, it's called the New English Translation. The footnotes on that Bible are like the text will be like this is a page. The text will be here, and there will be two columns of notes next to it, and then notes like two-thirds of the page, and the print's about that big. And it's inexpensive, so if you have a magnifying glass and you want to like really get into what are all the subtleties and things that pop out without having to learn another language. Which one is that? It's called the New English Translation, N-E-T. Now, unfortunately, there are like three NETs. There's the New Evangelical Translation, which is garbage. Don't get that. Uh, it's, it's just an awful translation. Um, they make a lot of assumptions. The New English Translation is the one I'm talking about. You want to find the full notes edition, it's called. Um, and I can remember to bring mine. Uh, I've got like a hardback one. It's not really any bigger than a regular Bible. It's just the print is incredibly small and real thin pages. And then there is one called the, uh, it's called the Net Bible, as in the Internet. And that is, uh, some folks got together to do a readable English translation of the Bible that is free from copyright. And that's what that Net, not abbreviation, but abbreviation for Internet, uh, is just a free, anybody can use it. Because if I, if I like do a blog entry and I quote the ESV, I have to count words and stuff. You can't do too many words from one place. You can't do an entire chapter. You have to make sure, okay, that is within their fair use. Anything that, you have to get permission. Uh, so you have to watch that. And it, like the King James, you can use the original King James because it's public domain. There's some other public domain ones, but you can't quote like ESV. You have to watch what you do. Um, 
or you use a lot of these are easy. You can use them free of copyright, but they're terrible translations, so you don't want to use them. So they developed this NET translation that's a good, nearly word for word, literal translation of the Bible, but it's done to be free of copyright. You don't want that one because you can read it on the internet. You can buy a hard copy, but the point is to do it uh, for online use. So you want the new English translation, full notes edition. It's, it's a nifty translation, and the AMP is also very good. Okay, um, I'm always, I can get sidetracked on translations. There are so many, and they all have a story, and they all had a reason why somebody did it. It's kind of interesting. Actually, somebody should write a book about that, about all the different translations about They've done it like the beginning when they first started translating it like into English and then you know, Luther, of course, and all that. Uh, so anyway, this eternal place of rest is the whole point of the Christian life. That's where we want to get. That's where Christ takes us. So we come, we listen to God's voice in the preached word. We taste his spiritual food in the, sacram in the sacrament. We join with the angels in their song of praise. That's all the stuff we do in the divine service. We rest from our labors. So God's faithful enter their rest from their works, or all the things we did during the week, just as God rested from his. And that is in verse 4, chapter 4, verse 4. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage he said, They shall not enter into my rest, since therefore it remains for some who enter it, blah, 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 and he goes on. Okay, so we enter it just as Jesus entered it in his exaltation when he entered into his glory at his ascension. Okay, and this is not a passive uh, entry. And we'll get to that in more detail in chapter 12. But the author, the preacher, is setting the stage for the rest of the book, the rest of his sermon. Uh, with this chapter, this is a turning point. So chapter 12, verse 22 to 24 says, But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angel, angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who were enrolled in heaven, who are enrolled in heaven, and to God the Judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus the Mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. That's a great turn of phrase, right? Because Abel's blood cried out to God from the ground, and now the preacher is talking about. And you will enter into your heavenly rest where the blood is sprinkled that speaks a much better word to you than the blood of Abel did from the ground. That's really neat imagery. Okay, so this celebration is similar, but it will surpass. That's what all of this looking forward always does in the Bible. So we have Old Testament types of things, and it's like, okay, this is good, but then it points forward to Christ, and that's better always. And then you have worship in the Old Testament, and that points forward to Christian worship, which is better because Christ has come. And then we have uh, people dying in the Lord in the Old Testament because they believe in the promise of the Messiah. The Messiah came, and we enter into heaven because that was better than the life here on earth. Okay, so... This celebration is similar to the celebration in the divine service uh, in the temple for the people being having this preached to or the house church, wherever they are. This celebration is similar to, but it surpasses God's, even God's presence in the temple in the Old Testament. So if you were to go back to Deuteronomy 12, uh, verses 5 to 7, you don't have to flip through your Bible. Every time I do this, because I'm just going to drop verses on you. Numbers, uh, Deuteronomy 12 says, Deuteronomy 12 says, But you shall seek the place that the Lord your God will choose out of all your tribes to put his name and make his habitation there. There you shall go, and you shall bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, your tithes, 
and the contribution that you present, your vow offerings, your free will offerings, and the firstborn of your herd and of your flock. And there you shall eat before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice, you and your households, in all that you undertake, in which the Lord your God has blessed you. So that's your, your eating of the sacrifices. You're participating in that worship, and that's good. But what we're going to have is better. If we look at Luke 14... And tell me to slow down if I'm going too fast. The more excited I get, the more faster I talk. And there's a, there's a lot here. Luke, Luke, wow. Did you say 14? I said 14. And it's like the whole chapter. We're not going to read the whole chapter. Uh, Luke 14. Okay, so that is, as you recall, Jesus was always working on the Sabbath, right? Well, of course, he's God. He can do what he wants. One Sabbath, when he went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they're watching him carefully, and behold, there was a man who had dropsy, and Jesus responded to the lawyers and the Pharisees, saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? And they wouldn't take the bait, for once. And he healed the man and sent him away, and they said to him, which of you having a son or an ox that has fallen, I like how he equates a, an animal with a son, if you have a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day, will not... It, will you not immediately pull him out? And they were speechless because, so what are you going to say to that? And yeah, of course you would do this. So why wouldn't God himself heal someone? Okay, so he's greater than the Sabbath. They did the parable of the, uh, the banquet and about, you know, he invaded, invited all these people and nobody came, so he just went and got everybody. And drag them in. And basically his whole point is talking about how Jesus is, is greater than the Sabbath. Or Lord of the Sabbath, in fact. Because the Sabbath was created for God, not for man. Man, created for man, not for God. Did I get that backwards? I got that backwards. The Sabbath was created for man, not for God. <laughs> right. Because that's for us to rest. Um... Okay, and that's where we rest from our works. Then again, here the preacher can mean two different things, which he does a lot. That's, that's a very Jewish Hebraic thing is to, to mean two things simultaneously. So it can be the burden of work in a fallen world, which we're going to hear this Sunday in the Old Testament reading is the fall into sin. Uh, one of the uh, works that we have rest from is the burden of work because of the fall into sin and you will you know you will work the ground and will raise up thorns and thistles and by the sweat of your brow you will eat your bread right so it's not like you're just going to walk through the garden and god makes everything grow perfect but now sin entered the world so now getting your daily bread is going to suck you have to work for it you know it's not going to be joyful it's going to be hard and from here on out it's going to be hard so you rest from that labor of how hard life is because of sin, right? Or it can also mean the work of making a living in your vocations. Like, how is that two different things? It's two very different things. You know, you, you are resting from the weariness of life because life's a drag. And then you're also resting from the fifth mental. And then you have the, and physical, the mental, you know, life is stressful, I guess we would say as modern people. And then you also rest from making a living. It's like, okay, you can make a living, you can make money, you can do it seven days a week if you want, but you really ought to take a day and relax. Uh, six days you will labor and do all your work, as God said. Okay, so it can also be rest from your fruitless labor of self-justification, right? So self-salvation, because that's ultimately what we sinfully always try to do, is uh, me, it's all about me. So... I know God justifies me and declares me righteous for the sake of Christ, but I can do my part. There's always that part of us that says, but I got to do my little bit. Uh, so you rest from that weariness and that fruitfulness that gains you nothing, which in turn creates stress and what on. So the fruitless works of our self-justification uh, and our self attempts at self-salvation. Uh, so Romans 3.20 says, uh, through the law comes the knowledge of sin. 
and you need to take a rest from that. Or Ephesians 2.9, uh, not by works so that no one can boast. You know, we are justified purely for the sake of Christ alone. Uh, or, or you can say it's the entire mortal life of toil and sorrow that is contrasted by, again, another psalm, Psalm 90, verses 14 to 17, that talks about uh, the new age of fertility and enjoyment that we will have in heaven and on the new earth. So all those different connotations of resting from your works, which one does the preacher mean in Hebrews? He means all of them. Any way you can think of it, he means all of them. Uh, don't take my word for it. That's what all the commentators say. It's, uh, it's, it's that, that there's so much nuance packed into that resting from your labors. Well, what kind of labors? There's like 10 sermons there because there's all kinds of different rest. Uh, and people have preached on every single one of them and they're all correct. So all the different ways, like there's an awful lot of need for us to rest, isn't there? And there's an, there, there's very good reasons why God created the day of rest for us. Because look at all the examples we just came up with. <laughs> right? There's a lawful lot to rest from. Why wouldn't people want to take an hour a week, really, just to go... <sighs> spiritual restoration condemnation to sin yes so we not only can we put that in the pot but the rest of the, the rest of the rest <laughs> oh yeah yeah oh absolutely <laughs> yeah so you've got you know you've got rest from actual labor you've got rest from how hard life is because we're sinners we have rest from all of our trying to help god out when we don't really need to so we waste all that mental energy we have rest from just the actual physical doing our jobs and we have rest from, keep naming rests, all of them count, all of them count. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all of it. And if you want more, uh, Isaiah 25, 8 and 9, uh, and you can look at Jeremiah 31, 10 to 14, which I actually think that was a good one. Jeremiah 31. Boy, that's a long book. It's like 60 chapters in Jeremiah. Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31, 10 to 14. Hear the word of the Lord. You notice all of these passages from the Old Testament, they all say, thus says the Lord, hear the word of the Lord. Of course, they're all prophets doing what prophets do. Hear the word of the Lord, all nations, and declare it in the coastlands far away. Say, he who scattered Israel will gather him and will keep him as a shepherd keeps his flock. For the Lord ransomed Jacob and has redeemed him from hands too strong for him. Then shall come and sing aloud on the height of Zion, and they shall be radiant over the goodness of the Lord, over the grain, the wine, and the oil, over the young of the flock and the herd. Their life shall be like a watered garden and they shall languish no more. So he pulls back that Eden imagery, right? Before the thorns and the thistles popped up. Then shall the young women rejoice in the dance and the young men and the old shall be merry and I will turn their mourning into joy, sensing a theme in all of these prophecies. I'll turn their mourning to joy. I will comfort them, give them gladness for sorrow in exchange. I will feast the soul of the priests with abundance and my people shall be satisfied with my goodness, declares the Lord. So you have that, that's a good idea. That's another good way to think of, of that day of rest, that time of worship. That's where you exchange your sorrow for joy. I like that. Uh, give them gladness for sorrow. So exchange your sorrow for gladness. And again, then the, the preacher is making us think of all these things. And it's like, yeah, you get that in the now. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. So you're getting it now, but the nut yet is going to be even better. You know, so this is a taste, just like a little, what, a, what do they call that, an amuse-bouche? A little amusing morsel that they serve at a fancy dinner. And it's like, oh, here's a little thing. This is going to taste real good, but that's all you get is this one little bite. Because that's <coughs> tease you that for all the rest of the meal it's going to come. Ah. Uh, Okay, so this is 
kind of gives you a conundrum then. So which is it? Is it, do we, do we come to, to receive this rest now? Or are we coming to anticipate the rest of the not yet? And of course, Lutherans would say yes. That both. We love uh, paradoxes. We love dualities. We love things that are more than one thing at a time. Um, so the preacher actually leaves it unexplained to promote a point, which is why this is a transition too, because he's going to explain a lot of this stuff in more detail later. So he's not going to, he doesn't talk about how this happens yet. I mean, I'm kind of going, okay, look at the Old Testament because this is what it does. That's what he wants us to do. And that is why, another reason why we go to church, why we listen to the word proclaimed, because he doesn't explain this yet. I explained it to you because I've got the teacher's edition, right? That tells me what all this means. It tells us what all this means. But it's unexplained to remember. We got to remember we're listening to his sermons, and sometimes your mind will get start going, well, yeah, that reminds me of something in the Old Testament. And he's doing that to promote the whole point of this, which is go to church, listen to the word, start the cycle of hearing and belief. And that is what the, the gist of all this is going to go and the momentum is going to build up. So he's promoting this cycle because he's not going to tell you how to do it yet. He's just going to tell you, this is what's going to happen. Well, how, preacher? What, how is this applied to me? How do I do this? He doesn't tell you yet. It comes later. He's going to explain it. But the point is to shift gears to make you anticipate, I want to know, but that's what I want. Yeah, that's what I want. How do I do it? But he doesn't tell you yet. He just tells you it's going to happen. And... Let the word do its work. You know, that's another reason we come to the place of rest, to hear the word, which is living and active because we're passive. That's when we become passive. We receive the word. Um, that, that's one of the things I think that, that's a problem in modern society. Uh, even people that read the Bible every day is we read the word, but we don't receive the word. We read it, but we... we we read it to remind us of stuff we already know. And I'm quoting my sermon for Sunday already. Uh, <laughs> we're going to talk about that. But one of our problems is we will use, just like people that like to pick a verse out of context to prove their point, we read the Bible sometimes to jog our memory of stuff we already know instead of receiving what it has to say. So we put binders on it. We put conditions on it, uh, which we shouldn't do. Or we get things another another message, <coughs> or a deeper message of what what we know on the top surface. I, you're saying that John um, MacArthur is doing a series on exactly that misinterpreted verses, or mm -hmm. you know, and it, it's wonderful. And, and uh, <coughs> the uh, today it was he was he used the example of the uh, prodigal son, and. Uh, what is the meaning of this? You know, oh yeah, the kid you know, got to do all this money. But by the time he got, it took him 30 minutes, you know, and he was talking about the father. He talked about the son that took the money and, you know, all his dad did and didn't want to whine because he didn't do it. But the larger, <coughs> or I should say larger, another big thing that I know was, was the father. Yeah, he's the most important character in the story. Exactly. Yep. And you think about the son and he went from the, you know, running and all right. it, was, it was just... Yeah, because he did you all things... You don't details, but when you look at, you know, right. each character in, the, right. in its own part of that story. Because the father does all the things a father, Jewish father, would never have done. Exactly. He, you, he doesn't... Fathers don't run. Yeah. <laughs> right? They don't do this. They don't do that. But what we invariably want to do, because that's what happens with a parable or a story, is who am I? Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, how do I make this about me? Yeah, yeah. And it's like, okay, I'm the prodigal son. No, you're not. You're the younger brother. You're the older brother. Yeah, yeah, you're the one that, that you don't know what happened yeah, at the end. Know. Did he go in <laughs> or didn't he? Was he stubborn or did he go join his brother? Yeah, yeah there's, they, they said to properly, someone said to properly preach the prodigal son, you have to do four sermons mm -hmm. from these different... Like older brother, younger brother, father, like twice. Yeah. Like start with the father, do the, the yeah. I think he did six. I think he did six. Yeah, it's a bunch. <laughs> because there's so much in there, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, so the preacher is getting us 
getting, getting us to, to think about, okay, receive, let the word go in. The word will do the work if you stay out of its way. That's actually one of the things they teach you uh, for preaching is actually, it's like, okay, when you get in the pulpit, proclaim the word, don't proclaim what you think about the word. You know, let the word do the work because we get in the way. If we get in the way, you're very likely going to say things that aren't right. So, so it's not it's not about you. It's about what the word says, which you, you got to remind yourself, yourself a lot. You preach to your congregation. Ba- basically, you, you write your sermon to yourself. Is what they said because it's whatever you need to hear is probably what they need to hear too. So yeah, yeah. That's why I always like. Well, I don't think that one was very good. <laughs> Those are usually ones that actually are. If, if you think it was pretty good, it probably wasn't. But yeah, <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, so back in Hebrews, verse 11, 4, 11. Now I remember why I usually have so many little ribbons. So I can find my place in Hebrews 4. Hebrews 4, verse 11 says, let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. So it's calling back to verse one, appealing to the fear that the preacher is exhorting to his people to be eager to begin and continue the cycle of letting the word do the work and let the word deliver the rest that is provided to us in worship in the divine service um, you know and again that's why all the old all the old german writers always called it the Gottesdienst instead of the worship the Gottesdienst, the divine service because that means it's not it, it's not us serving the divine it's the divine is the one doing the serving so that's where god serves us this is where we come to get what he has to give us so the Gottesdienst, the divine service the rest that's provided to us so this is, again, a community. You know, we're going to keep harping on this sense of community. Community, it's a communal race to quest after this lifelong entry into the eternal rest. So there's that now and not yet. So we, all of us together are questing after. We're going to get it each week. We're going to get the rest, the sacraments, the word that God is offering to us. And that instead of getting bored with it or used to it, we continue to hunger for it uh, and look forward to the really ultimate rest that we're going to have in heaven. Uh, Because if you neglect it here, there's a very high likely that you'll fall off the path, that you'll reject the word and that you won't enter into that eternal rest. That's why we got to hear it over and over and over and over because the gospel is foolishness to fallen men. Okay, so this race, this encouragement, mutual encouragement to come and enter the place of rest, it's a matter of literal life and death. Uh, if, if you, if you uh, disdain it, if you hold it in contempt, um, you're not going to finish the race. You're not going to enter that promised rest. And then the preacher tells us why. So now he's going to get into, he hasn't gotten into the how yet, but he's, he starts talking about the, the, the why. Now he does explain why, the how to. Uh, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit of joints and marrow, and no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him, to whom we must give account. There's that end of the Athanasian Creed, or the, yeah, the Athanasian Creed that we heard last Sunday, where we have to give an account for all the good and the bad. Okay, so in verse 12, the preacher now regards the word as this living because it is this living and active thing because the word became flesh and dwelt among us but the word is still living and active through the spirit so the word living active and addresses uh, aspects of god's work not as a judge but as a surgeon a surgeon a heart surgeon okay it talks about the uh, yeah the esv has Piercing the division is two-edged sword, the scalpel. Okay, division of, 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 of discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Uh, even better literal translation of the Greek is the fantasies and intentions of the heart. I like that. So it, it pierces right to 
beneath our layer of nonsense. I almost used another word. Our, our, our BS, if you will. Okay, all the stuff that we add, all that baggage, all the nonsense that we put on things, it pierces to the heart of the matter. And it gets right to it. Because when God shines the light on it, you can't hide from that. It's, it's exposed, just as it says, right? So the word is described as sharper than any two-edged sword. And, and, and someone once said that, of course, you know, Jesus being the good Lutheran pastor he is, that two-edged sword, the two sides are law and gospel, right? You know, so the law convicts your conscience and then the gospel delivers the promise. So the word is able to judge, right? The word judges. The word knows what's in the heart. It knows what has to be done to correct it, to do this surgery, if you will, this analogy I came up with that I stole from somebody, if I'm honest. Uh, so this, this two-inch sword is actually a scalpel that just cuts the heart, gets, gets right to the disease, cuts that out, knows how to correct it, knows how to patch it, knows how to fix it. Okay, so... That's why we should be eager. That is why the preacher is insisting. This is why you go and go to the divine service as a group because you have to do it together. You can't do it on your own. And again, no creature is hidden from that sight. Naked and helpless uh, it describes us as our, our hopeful condition but also helpless condition, right? Right? Um, as the word addresses us in that divine service, and the preacher now includes, he's now include grammatically, he's now including himself. Um, you don't, again, you don't get that from English, but he's including himself in with the congregation. So it's all of us, all of us are there, hopeful but helpless, and passively receiving the word. Okay, so now by our confession together, that's why we recite creeds, we confess our faith in Christ and we agree with everything that the Father has revealed to us about his Son and by extension what God says about us on account of his Son, right? So we confess our faith that God basically, John three sixteen, God sent his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life, so because his son died and rose for our salvation, then what God says about us is you are not guilty. You are my beloved child also. Okay? So Hebrews 4, 1 through 13 teaches the people, remember, this is a sermon, teaches the people about the divine service and what their role in it is. If I wish I said that at the start, this would have been a lot shorter. <laughs> but that's what it's about. Okay? So we have these different points. So we, again, we have that eschatological now and not yet. You know, the church stands between, it's got a foot in both worlds, right? It stands between earth and heaven, between time and eternity, this world and the world to come. And that's why the churches are built the way they are. That's why you have a nave and a sanctuary in your uh traditional architecture of a church, it teaches something about it, about what it's for. So we gather in the nave, then we enter the sanctuary to receive the body and blood of Christ. So we're anticipating the not yet, and then we return to the nave, and then we disperse from there. Right? So we gather, we enter into the place of rest to receive the medicine of eternal life, and then we return So, second point was that Christian, our Christian worship is primarily a matter of rest. That's all we've been talking about this summer. So we rest with God in his presence from our labors. So we go from being active to passive, we receive. And then it describes how the congregation enters God's rest in the worship service. It happens as we hear the gospel. It happens as we believe its promises. We receive rest by listening to that life-giving word, letting it do its work, again, passive. Uh, not only a day of rest from work, but a time of rest 
for hearing God's word. Uh, we mentioned that earlier. And then the uh, divine service then gives us rest and rejuvenation through the living act of word by which he judges us and heals us. And he justifies and sanctifies us. He renews us. He empowers us. All these things that he gives us. Okay. During the worship service, one of the things that always makes me know that the Jesus will be here to say is when we repeat the Apostles' Creed of the Nicene Creed. Mm -hmm. That, like, the core of why I'm here. Why did I come? Or this is why I'm here. And that's why this we do it why, together. This is why we yep. are together. Mm -hmm. This is why I came here, because I believe this. Mm -hmm. The other folks say we believe it too, but, I mean, it, it is an individual, you know. Uh, yeah, and that's why we say I believe instead of we believe. It's like, because you can only speak for yourself. I believe, but all these other people say I believe too. So guess what? We all believe in one true God, right? May you have that Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. It's like his hymns teach too, <laughs> right? I mean, and that's one of the, it's one of the, like a neat exercise is to look through the liturgy and see which way is the action's going. Is it God to us, us to God? Hint, which way am I facing? <laughs> so if I'm speaking God word to you, I'm looking at you. If we're speaking back to God, I'm, looking at the cross, usually if you're pointed the right way. So it's just interesting to see, watch when I turn, because that tells you, okay, which way is the direction going in the service? Mm -hmm. And it's all, it all, again, it all teaches, it all has, has meaning. There's all reasons why it developed that way. Okay, so, you want to keep going? Do you want to keep going? We got like three, three more verses in this chapter. I don't think we'll get to all of it, but. So, verse 14, since then we have a great high priest who passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, which again, is what creeds are. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Ah, we're going to get to the how now. But one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. This is one of the most important verses in the New Testament, in my opinion. They're all important, but let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. We're going to talk about a little Luther translation. Uh, then we may receive mercy to find grace and help in the time of need. All right, we are going to talk about the original language a little bit in these couple of verses because there's, there's there, one word in Greek is an entire phrase in English a lot of times. So like verse 14, who has gone through? Uh, uh, who has passed through in the ESV? Uh, that's one word in Greek. Um, is it di, di hilo, dota. It's a very hard word to pronounce. But the, the verb tense it uses, who has gone through, it's a completed past action that results in a present state. All right, so yeah, they have, there are so many verb tenses. Uh, so this one is, so this is a past action that results in the present state, which like, okay, but don't all past actions do that? Kind of, but uh, bear with me. Then we have that word, this word in 15, which is the most important word in the chapter, I think. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. And this is where the original language gets important. Uh, the word translated as uh, sympathize is more uh, so sam sympathy yeah sympath sympathy sigh so it sounds just like that's where we get our word sympathize from but the word sympathize in Greek doesn't mean uh, oh yeah I, I feel bad because you feel bad so I'm, I'm sympathetic with what you feel. It doesn't even come close to what, what a Greek-speaking person in the first century meant when they used that verb. So it doesn't just mean sympathetic to your emotion. It means how that person who is sympathetic acts and how he suffers offering sympathetic help to the person who is suffering. So it's, it's like when you use the word medically. Or, or when you use the word scientifically. So you'll talk about like sympathetic vibration. What's the vibration? That's why the space shuttle blew up the first one. 
So you have gases slipping through an O-ring. It causes it to shimmy. And the little shimmy here spreads to the whole thing and the whole thing starts shimming and it blows up. Or sympathetic vibrations in something like a pipe organ. So you have many different ranks of pipes that make different sounds. This one's a flute, this one's a trumpet, this one is a block. Uh, but when one vibrates, that one vibrates too, even though you may not be putting air through it, you get sympathetic sounds or in a uh, piano is the best example. Each hammer is actually hitting three strings, except the real big ones, it might only be one. But the hammer's hitting three strings. They're all tuned the same, but three sounds better than one because one vibrates and then the strings next to it also vibrate. Even though you're not playing them, that's where you get overtones. So uh, Bosendorfer actually created this fantastic piano that they only built like a handful of them in the world. It's got an extended bass end. It's got like an extra half octave over here on the left hand side. And it's got a cover over it. So you don't accidentally play them all the time because sparingly. And you don't have to. That piano sounds like no other piano because those strings exist. And when you play those notes, those strings vibrate sympathetically and actually are creating music, even though you didn't play them. Mm -hmm. So that is what causes the richness, and that's why some places sound acoustically so fantastic because of acoustics and the way things reflect. So that's probably the best description for what sympathy means in Greek. So it's Christ is not unable to sympathize. He was able to sympathize, meaning he felt are suffering because he suffered. So when you think of Christ's sympathy for us, it's like, oh, Jesus feels sorry for you. No, it is way huger than that. And that's why this is the most important verse, I think, in this whole book. And that's the most important word. So it, it describes how the one who has sympathy acts and what he suffers in order to offer this sympathetic help to someone who suffers. So it doesn't mean I suffer with you. I literally suffer for you. Okay, it's a pretty good description of Jesus, isn't it? Right, and then in the next verse, uh, with our weaknesses. Again, more nuance there. It's not just physical weakness, um, disability, or even uh, sickness, which is how those words are used elsewhere uh, in in the New Testament, but it's a, uh, with our weaknesses as a catch term for human vulnerability, human weakness in the face of temptation uh, that results from sin and is results in sin and results from sin. So this with our weaknesses, um, so many times we want to talk about sin, and I think you see that in American evangelicalism a lot, where they don't call sin, sin. They call it our mistakes. Oh, I, we make our mistakes. Or we have our weaknesses. We have our fallibilities. We don't like to use the word sin. Well, well, because it's translated that way here. But it means more than just weaknesses. Yeah, it's okay to use the word weakness if you mean weakness means Everything about you that's bad because you are a sinner and it creates more sin. So if you have that nuance, then yeah, you can call it weakness. It means sin. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not just, how is it exactly translated? Uh, who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. All right, so now put it together. Who is unable, someone who is unable to suffer on our behalf for our sin. Oh, now we're getting to the how. Now we're seeing what our great high priest does. So there's a lot, a lot. What? I like to sympathize with Mary Reese. Huh? I can just like sympathize with Mary Reese right after they get me places because I am one. <laughs> right, because otherwise it's like, well, you know, you, you can say like one soldier talking to another soldier. Mm -hmm. They can sympathize with that soldier getting through because they understand it, they lived it. I can't sympathize with a soldier because I wasn't a soldier, okay? I can sympathize with someone who is persecuted for proclaiming the gospel because I 
have been exposed to some persecution, but not on that scale. But on my little modern scale, the little tiny little things someone might say or do, and it's like, holy crap. Imagine how that person must have felt in the face of this when it was just some little offhanded comment like ruined my whole afternoon. So yeah, it's a sympathy, but it's a scale thing. Not so with Christ, right? So this is oddly, I'm going to find the right page, dummy. I, I usually write down where in the church here the chapter is used, and I didn't. Somewhere I have a chart. Okay, so this is chapter four. Yeah, and it's weird because this whole first section here is year B, proper 24. So right before the end of the church year, we're going to hear this in church. It's not stuck anywhere. It's like, okay, it's a random place, I guess. But this last three verses, we hear that on the first Sunday of Lent. It's like, okay, that yeah, that is something we need to hear. So it's like, okay, we're getting you ready to go into this penitential season. What's the first thing we're going to hear? That Jesus has this because he is capable of all these things. You know, so it makes sense that you would use those verses to kind of set the tone for this season. Um, and then another great word in verse 15 is, is uh, chorus, without, the word without. Uh, this preposition, without, uh, it has... It doesn't, it, does, it doesn't mean without as in, um, when we talk about Jesus being without sin, meaning he never sins. It's a little different. It's more like the uh, propane tanks are without the church. They're outside and separate from the church because you don't put propane tanks inside. Jesus was without sin. He suffered the suffering of sin, but he was without sin. Sin is as far from Christ as you can get. That's the kind of spatial distancing that that word is implying, not just uh, not having in the absence of something. It just means there's a gulf. Mm -hmm. Kind of like saying that man, because of sin, is without God. Same connotation, okay? And uh, so it means far from, separate from, so it dissociates Jesus from sin, or a, um, another way, another thing it can mean is, a, is separating a valid assertion from its contradiction, uh, which I only bring that up because I, I read it in a commentary. I thought it was cool because you think of, okay, Jesus is, he became sin later. We're going to hear that. He became sin. Paul wrote that. He became sin for us, even though he never sinned. He became sin. So that is... Uh, paradoxical, contradictory, strange. Uh, it's this idea of without, that, that Jesus could suffer all these things and not have done the things that would require the suffering to take place. Uh, and then verse 16, and that's where we'll stop. We'll summarize it next week. But then verse 16, uh, what is it? To throna tis cardios, to the throne of Caritos, to the throne of grace, it says here. So let us then with confidence draw near to, we're getting to the how again, to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Throne of grace is great. Uh, I like to read Luther's German once in a while because his translation in German is clearer than the English at times. This is one of those times. He translated instead of the throne of grace, he translated as zu dem Gnadenstuhl. Gnadenstuhl is mercy seat, as in the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant where the cloud of the presence dwelled in the tabernacle, right? So the throne of grace, he translated as the mercy seat. I like That's great. So let us with confidence draw near to the mercy seat that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And of course, why can we draw to the place of rest? Why can we approach? Could you approach in the Old Testament? Could you approach the mercy seat? No. What would have happened to you? You would have been killed because you weren't allowed to come into the presence. But now, Good Friday, it is finished. 
the, temp the curtain in front of the Holy of Holies was torn in two. That separation, that without we just talked about, is gone. So now we may approach the mercy seat to obtain the mercy. That's where we'll stop tonight. That's a good stopping place. So yeah, this is a cool transitional chapter into, you're maybe going to be bored because he's going to start repeating himself. We've hit so many of these themes and whatnot, and it's going to start, yeah, you won't be bored. This is a cool book. There is so much going on in this book that we don't pay that much attention to it. Yeah, I mean, we hear a lot of it in church. I don't think we make the connections we should sometimes, so maybe we should occasionally preach from it. How about that? So we'll do a quick review of this next week, and then we will move on. Questions, comments, anything? This is exciting. Those last three verses are exciting to me. I love those. Uh, Max Lucado, I love it. But he was and he talked about the people about him being well, I you know, I don't have to use the uh, sympathizing. But he describes it as this uh, he was just in Nazareth. He said, Look for a single mom. This is after what happened to Joseph, the judge, and he died. And Jesus had dirty hands, sweat strange shirts, and this may surprise you, common looks, like we're told in Isaiah 53. Raised in an overlooked nation among oppressed people in an obscure village. Can you spot him? In the adobe house with the thatched roof? Yes, the one with the chickens in the yard and the gang of teenagers repairing chairs in the shed. <laughs> yeah, they They've tried to accomplish that in movies sometimes. In The Last Temptation of Christ, I don't recommend anybody watch that movie. Mm -hmm. I, I watched it. In The Last Temptation of Christ, where Jesus is actually making crosses as his job of a carpenter, for whatever reason. But it's like they really depict him as he just looks like an ordinary person mm -hmm. because that was the point of the movie. Um, other than that, that has no redeeming value whatsoever. The soundtrack's incredible by Peter Gabriel. Other than that, horrible movie. Uh, in the new TV show, if I told you, I told you guys about the new TV show, right? Well, I don't know whether we weren't here. Maybe. Uh, okay, so there's this new uh, TV show called The Chosen. The Chosen. Uh, it's entirely crowdfunded, so people who watch it are giving them the money to do this, and the episodes cost millions of dollars. You know, this is not a cheap thing people are doing. So there's some big donors. They're on season two. I think they're about two-thirds of the way through season two now. You can watch it for free. It's not on television. It's uh, There's an app. Uh, so you can watch it on a smart TV or on your phone or on your computer or whatever. Uh, it's 100% free. There's no commercials or anything. And you just watch it. And it's the life of Jesus, mostly told from the point of view of the apostles. I mean, so you're really getting into the backstories that aren't necessarily in the Bible, but they're using the Bible to unpack it. Uh, so they take a little bit of liberty, but it's very well done. I'm usually highly critical of this stuff. I usually hate Christian programming because it's not well done. This is a fantastic TV show. I showed two episodes of it to the youth retreat and confirmation retreat this year. And everybody's like, okay, if these kids like it, you know it's good. Because these kids consume a lot of media. I, picked, I did cherry pick two episodes. Because you can watch it out of order. You know how the story ends. So uh, There's no spoilers. But the way they did it, they did something very creative with the uh, story of the Good Samaritan. Kind of did it in a way that you didn't see. Like, is that what they just did? Holy, wow, that was really good. And then the story of the Canaanite woman at the well. And it's like, whoa. Of course, everybody's in tears because you're like, oh, that was so good. It's fantastic. I would really recommend everybody watch this show. Uh, the way they depict Jesus is, um, first off, they get it right that that his carpenter doesn't just mean woodworker. He does their stuff. Uh, and, and you just see stuff like different Bible stories from the perspective of Jesus as an itinerant preacher doing his thing. Uh, it's cool. It's extremely enjoyable when they are using scripture. It's word for word from scripture. They're not embellishing it. 
but then they fill in gaps to make the story. So you got Mary Magdalene, you've got Peter. The first time I've seen Peter depicted as I have always preached Peter being tough, young in the prime of his life, not an old man with a beard getting ready to die. Uh, it's like that. Yes, that's what Peter is like. <laughs> that's exactly what I've been saying. Yeah, it's it's cool. Watch it. I enjoy it. I, I actually I wait because they don't put episodes out super regularly. It's like every couple of weeks or so they put a new episode because again this is very expensive and they're just kind of doing it. Uh, it's not on YouTube. No, but you can watch it. Like I said, you watch it on the internet on their site basically. Yeah, well, the book shows and, and actually their their streaming and their app is better than anything commercial anybody's put out. It's like they did their homework with this. Oh, um, it's really good. I'm trying to think. Who is it that was involved in it that I didn't care for? But I don't want to fake color it because I've done a really good job of this. Who did? Oh, it's the dude that wrote the Left Behind books. The guy that wrote the Left Behind books, it's his son that's involved in the Tim production Ray. of this. Huh? Tim Ray. Whatever his name is. And like I can't stand those books. <laughs> I mean they're okay, but ugh. Um, anything that has the rapture in it, I'm not really fond of, obviously. Uh, but it's like, okay, well, he's not in directly involved. His son's involved in They're like, okay, well, I'm going to go get funding for people. And it's, they're filming it in Texas. It looks like the Middle East, the, the, the spots they picked. Everything looks, the, the costumes are correct. The way they do the Romans is correct. The food they're eating is correct. Um, everything is done right. It's, I can't say enough good things about the show. So let's see if they can keep it going. So I encourage you to watch it because it's neat. Uh, anyway, I don't know why I went off on that tangent. All right, I'll shut up now. Okay, well, uh, I'm just going to pray tonight. So. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, again for opening your word to us this evening. Uh, we thank you for, for everything that you show us to to hunger and thirst for the gifts that you have to give us in the divine service. Uh, help us to take this message into our homes, into our workplaces, into the people uh, that we encounter so that we may be um, prepared and able uh, to give an answer to why we have the hope we have within us, uh, that we may somehow through our uh, small ways have the Holy Spirit work through us to bring others to believe in you so that they can come to your places, rest as well. In Jesus' name, amen.